Uh, our next presenter is Barry Lavelli. He's over in, in Canada. He's coming in online and, uh, uh, you know, hopefully there, there won't be any hiccups. There always seems to be some hiccup with, with technology. Um, but Barry, Barry is here. Um, Okay, over to you, Barry. Okay. Can you hear me well back there? That's over, that's over 10,000 kilometers you can hear me. <laughs> anyway, um, you know, th thank you so much for inviting me. And um, there seems to be a, a string of bad luck for me trying to get over to uh, um, your side of the world. I don't know what that means. But um, so I, I appreciate the opportunity to share some of the work that we do here. Um, in Manitoba, basically, um, but uh, and I appreciate the welcome to your side. Um, and I'm on Treaty One territory, and um, I'll, there's a couple of languages um, that my parents um, knew. They knew four languages, um, so I'm going to use one of them for just a moment. And so it's Barry Le Valley Dishnekas Saint Laurent Dongi Makwandu Dam, and then I would do it in French, but I'm not going to do it in French. Um, but basically, uh, my um, my traditional name is Turtle Island Man, and that was given to me through a dream from my ancestors to one of the elders I work with. Um, and there is responsibility to that name, and I have very much not uh, attended to that responsibility um, yet. Um, but uh, my Christian name is Barry Lavalley, and, and I belong to um, three territories in this on these lands here. One is uh, Duck Bay, uh, the other one is Lake Manitoba First Nation, and the other place is St. Laurent. And so I'm on the territory that my ancestors have been here for thousands of years. Um, I'm a physician by training. Um, and when I did medicine, uh, one of the things um, that I found uh, in the 80s, or you know, the few of us who were in medicine, was that the explanatory models about the discrepancies and the disparities for Indigenous health were solely uh, inappropriate. And it was, in retrospect, when I look at that, it really was an episode of extreme violence um, that we couldn't attend to because we couldn't name it. And so over the course of my career, uh, it was necessary to reach out to colleagues and brothers and sisters in New Zealand and Australia and Hawaii to be able to try and sort this out so that we can make sense of what's going on uh, with our communities. Um, and that has been my struggle um, because I'm not a PhD, I do have a master's, but I've had to learn uh, other things in order to be able to understand what's going on uh, with our community today. And so that's what I do all the time. I practice medicine 95% um, with my people um, I'm also the lead for the Indigenous Health, Lo Indigenous Health Longitudinal course for undergraduate medicine at the RADI Faculty of Health Sciences. Um, and I also do some um, uh, population-based uh, research around chronic diseases like diabetes and chronic kidney disease, especially trying to uh, look at its relationship to intergenerational violence, uh, especially against uh, our women, uh, so much so that we believe uh, babies, uh, before they even leave their moms, are prepped to develop uh, chronic kidney disease and diabetes uh, because of the uh, violence uh, that uh, women uh, and families undergo in terms of poverty, uh, gestational diabetes, um, uh, and those kinds of things. So um, well, I'm just going to spend a few minutes with you, um, and I want to, uh, you to know uh, that in, in Manitoba, and I don't do any more leadership work here in Canada generally, just uh, in my little area of Manitoba here, but to use the word racism is is new, and, and the settlers, the white and the coloured settlers to my lands or my territories are getting used to it. Um, not that we're actually waiting for them, because we're actually using racism, whether they like it or not. Um, so we don't really attend to whiteness um, over here, and... So I'll do this particular presentation, um, and I want to uh, you t I want to acknowledge um, that my cousins uh, live well below the poverty line, and that uh, although I'm a physician, and I have food every day, and I have a safe place to sleep, 
and my kids have a bit of potential, we do not have privilege. Um, because for us to assign the word privilege to the Indigenous body is to acquiesce into the whiteness um, that invades our territories. So although I have money to make sure that I have food, um, I still am an internal refugee of Settler Canada. And that's why I put that on the slide. <clears throat> so I'm just going to jump right into it um, and look at Indigenous specific racism. And Ricky, thank you so much for giving such a great presentation. So I don't, there's things I don't have to do because of that. Thank you. Um, but I wanted to really just spend a few minutes on background and then I wanted to construct what Sector Canada looks like. And then I wanted to talk in a third uh, person about the Indigenous body. And I get that kind of analysis from the work that Shreen Razak, she's now at UCLA, but she was at OISE at U of T. And she and I work at looking at the um, racialized body and how does that work in settler society? What's its purpose, et cetera. Um, and that really is specific, even, even though people can't see it, to health and healing uh, challenges for indigenous and racialized people. But um, in 1492, um, some very greedy white people came from Spain and different parts of Europe, uh, really wanting to uh, look at um, uh, getting, uh, I think, spices and different kinds of things. But within a um, 100 years, it's estimated, there are tens and tens of millions of Indigenous peoples on my two islands over here who were killed. And it comes in threes. And it's interesting that disease, in terms of you know, infectious disease, spread rapidly, famine, constructed and otherwise, and all now genocidal slaughter. Um, so our lands over here, despite people uh, sitting nicely on beaches in Florida and California, sit on beaches that are really stained with Indigenous uh, blood from the slaughters that went on in our territories from 1492 and on. And interestingly, um, a couple of references or, or a list of books that I'll leave at the end of this presentation. Uh, you have to think that um, for Canada, at the contact on the eastern borders of our island, um, Indigenous people died of smallpox long before they ever saw a white man. So it could be as much as two generations. So by, so by the time white people actually came to the inland of our island, the up to 50% and more of communities were decimated. Um, and so disease came long before. It's because in a turtle island over here, uh, we had pathways of exchange from coast to coast. We were already exchanging. We weren't these you know, savage people that the white people make us out to be. We're actually doing a lot of exchange and interchange. And so the viruses and the bacteria were carried from person to person. Um, so, and why is that important? Uh, you know, I say that disease, famine, and slaughter, because as early as, you know, uh, late as, you know, 100, 150 years ago, uh, James Daschuk in Clearing the Plains, and that reference is there as well, um, he talked about the three things as well, although he left out uh, slaughter. So his argument was that Western Canada up to BC was cleared uh, by disease and famine. But James Daschuk was a bit shy to talk about the slaughter that went on, specifically of the Cree people uh, in our territories. So that that disease, famine, and slaughter, that thematic phenomena occurs today when you even look, uh, and I'm going to say this only once because I'm in a position of being a male and, um, you know, I can't really talk about um, uh, women's issues, but the missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls in our territories. As a physician, uh, I work with some of our, 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 our sisters and this phenomena still occurs in, in Canada. Um, but, the, you know, one of the frustrating things of being an Indigenous man who practices medicine and tries to do a little bit of stuff in scholarly work is to contend with the upheld fallacy of what settler Canada is. And it's a white fallacy, even if people are colored and new to our lands. Um, and it's this idea that we celebrate diversity and inclusion, of course, except for Indigenous people. And we claim a good heart for the millions of refugees and invite them to our, my territories, except for the internal refugees 
uh, just down the street. And so there's this paradox that exists in settler Canada, and it, it, trans, it, it, it projects itself to inadequate resources and financing for obvious, uh, uh, just incredible disparities that we have for some of our communities. And so we live in this world where it's okay for people coming across the ocean to be given the things uh, that are uh, uh, available for people who can exert their human rights. But we in Canada as Indigenous people, many of us do not have full human rights and we live that way. Um, and so that's a really hard space uh, to be in. But one of the things uh, in terms of the Indigenous body, and Razak does this in a, a number of her uh, publications when she looks at uh, um, Indigenous men dying in custody, and think about uh, the Indigenous body entering a healthcare system as also an Indigenous body in custody. Because the word custody in the context of Shireen's uh, uh, publications means that somebody, something has power over you, which is really around uh, racism, because racism is about not only stereotyping, but it's also about the power that you can actually influence that engagement. And that's really, for me, um, for what we see, a really basic equation about Indigenous specific uh, racism. But what Razak suggests in some of her work is that the settler is compelled, and this is paraphrased, uh, to visit the grave of the dead Indian and to kick at it and then to walk away, but is compelled to go towards that grave and kick at it. And you have to think about that. Like, what does that mean for those of you in the audience who are settlers to Australia? Like, whether you came a day ago or whether you came uh, just after um, that guy came to your shores and uh, <laughs> uh, uh, cook. Or whatever, yeah, you know, if you came after that. You have to think about your positionality in the context of what we're talking about today. Your positionality in the context of seeing uh, Indigenous people to those lands over there who live in poverty and walk the streets of, of you know, Adelaide or, or whichever, you know, like, why does that exist? And what is, what are you doing in Australia? Um, but really, you know, the, this idea of being compelled to come to the gravesite is really, I think, what Razak is speaking about, is really saying that deep in your heart, as a settler to our lands, you know something is wrong. So although it appears that you actually sleep well on stolen lands, you sleep unwell. You sleep disturbed. That something is a matter. I have to attend to, that we have to attend to. And so kicking at the dirt is not about disrespecting the grave of the dead, but it's around understanding that your positionality has to be interrogated and it has to change in order for true equity to um, emerge in settler societies in Canada and perhaps in other areas. So that indigenous specific racism needs to be named. It's not, you know, I, no, no offense. It's not about the unconscious bias, the implicit bias is okay. But what is its praxis? What is its manifestation in terms of the health and health outcomes for Indigenous peoples? It is violent and it kills. So, you know, with the medical students I work with, whether they feel uh, uncomfortable or not, I tell them, go see a counselor, because I'm not going to attend to that in the classroom. If you can't deal with your positionality and your power uh, as an emerging physician, then don't see Indigenous people. That's my solution. Because what we realize in the work that we do um, uh, with medical education here in Winnipeg is that the medical student uh, was, has been known to come to medical school, for example, five generations ago. So in that colonial context, that person who's unborn for five generations, his or her ancestors know they'll go to medical school. And concomitantly, for an Indigenous person who's alive today, their ancestors were really hoping that they'd survive the onslaught of colonization, not get into medical school, just to survive. And so the juxtaposition of that paradox of how uh, settler society or settler Canada is created is quite volatile. 
And the issue about uh, white people feeling uncomfortable in the context is not really our issue. Uh, it's the issue of white and colored settlers and the creation of false uh, societies like Settler Canada. So we as Indigenous people, we don't have resources, uh, money or power to actually engage and reconcile uh, actions because it requires power and we don't have power. So the current state uh, for Indigenous people here is no different um, than many places. Our health outcomes and our potential for wellness are markedly uh, lower than other occupants to our stolen lands, and for a lot of reasons. And medicine and nursing graduate practitioners, many, I won't say all, are really unprepared to detect the ways in which colonization marks and embeds itself within the bodies of Indigenous peoples and their presentations in clinical environments. And I say that because it appears as if it's a, uh, a, a you know, a checkbox, you know, do blood pressure, uh, check this or that, but it's not. Really what I'm saying is that the uh, emerging practitioners have to learn to look in a special mirror and see their positionality in context and deal with it and deal with the racism that emerges from them. And it, it appears in some of our research that we're doing uh, with colleagues in BC is that the, the racism is a bottomless pit. It appears under, that you can't actually do much about it. And it, that's not completely true. Um, so the Sanders Cultural Safety Training Program, I work with them uh, in different environments, but one uh, some of the work I do is with Laurie Harding. I, I think she's uh, published, she and her colleagues have, or rather, have presented on your side. But her uh, research reveals widespread uh, Indigenous-specific stereotyping uh, in BC. And what's interesting is that when we interrogated uh, the stereotypes, you could pick one stereotype off an Indigenous body, another one rapidly appears. And so it seems like an endless source of stereotyping. But you have to see it differently you see that the person who perpetuates a stereotype, a non-Indigenous person, um, actually has a great source and has trouble seeing the Indigenous person in his or her own true identity. So that we say that an Indigenous person cannot enter a healthcare system except in stereotype. This is really important to understand because the stereotype itself that's Indigenous specific hinges on and the praxis for that is violence. It is racism. They go hand in hand. So even if somebody says that, you know, Mrs. So-and-so, I think, drinks, and even if that Mrs. So-and-so who comes in for a UTI gets uh, an antibiotic, there still is violence in, uh, a, uh, in a practitioner expressing that stereotype. It has consequences, even though a person might receive an antibiotic. It's really important to use your imagination about how that can work. Uh, one of my med students... Um, she was assisting in surgery in a hospital just here in, in Winnipeg. And so there was she, the ENT surgeon, a uh, nurse who was assisting, and an anesthetist. And um, so the woman on the, floor, on the bed was an Indigenous woman who was having, uh, uh, she had a fractured um, septum of her nose. And so they were going to do a, a procedure. But what the ENT surgeon did was before, when the woman was out, he put his fist up in the air, over the woman's body and he pretended he was going to hit her in the face and he looked at his team he said this is how she got the broken nose and the team went silent and the nurse um, said that was inappropriate but the medical student came back to us and so we had to debrief about what that was about so if you think about that as a stereotype even with a physicality about it you have to think that when that woman went into post-op, you know, for post-care, perhaps she didn't get as much uh, pain medications as she should have because that stereotype would permeate the whole environment. You know, so you have to really think about how these stereotypes manifest themselves in a timely way as well as spatially. Um, so Indigenous-specific stereotyping is proxy. Uh, for Indigenous-specific racism. And stereotyping to harm is continuous. Mm 
I just briefly want to go over Brian Sinclair. We studied uh, Brian Sinclair. Uh, his death after the inquest uh, was uh, finished here in Manitoba. Um, and interestingly, we had Shereen Razak do a talk during the same time as the, as the um, uh, inquest was being held. And she did a, She was in one of our theaters. And uh, she said to the crowd, she said, I know there's an inquest going on about the death of an Indigenous man. Uh, just across the way here. She says, I want to send them a message. She says, I want them to stop the inquest. I'll finish writing the report. That's all she said. And when the inquest was finished, I went over it with her, and true enough, the inquest only upheld whiteness. That's all it did. It failed to locate how stereotypes, racism, actually manifested in securing uh, his death. And interestingly, when you look at the inquest, um, and for those of you who don't know, he, he, had, he is a paraplegic um, from violence against an Indigenous man. There's this, this is how uh, racism works. Uh, so he, he had a bladder indwelling, uh, a catheter in his bladder, and it was clouded. And his physician put a little note together, told Brian, look, Brian, we'll send you over to the Health Science Center in a, with a, in a cab. Give this to the triage person. Brian, yeah, I'll do it. And he did. You could look on online for the uh, video. Um, but he was never uh, seen. Uh, he was found with about seven hours. Uh, he'd been dead for about seven hours by the time they actually uh, attended to him about 30-something hours later. And they vain, they vainly attempted a resuscitation, which obviously, you know, the stiff body, for those of you who are doctors, is not going to happen. Um, but what was interesting and really sad uh, to witness with the uh, inquest and the analysis that we did as a group was that they inflicted him with stereotypes even in death. It, it, was, it was outrageous. Um, and, and interestingly, at the inquest, when you look, the nurses and the attendees freely spoke about how they thought he was sleeping it off like all drunk Indians do, was homeless like all drunk all Indians are, intoxicated, on and on and on. And they freely spoke about that and said, I, I made no mistake, I just assumed he was drunk. You know, and they couldn't actually uh, realize by doing so, they secured his death by doing so. It, it was crazy. But Brian actually, he volunteered. <coughs> Excuse me. He volunteered um, down the road and he had friends and family who loved him. He was an intelligent man. Um, and he was nothing uh, like the uh, stereotypes that this uh, white uh, system uh, tried to assign him. And at autopsy, there are no substances detected uh, in his body. And even one of the neuropathologists, who was later elevated to a, a leadership position, remarked how lesions that he found, because they, they removed Brian's uh, brain and spine, because I guess removing this brain and spine, somehow you could find the cause of why he didn't get a catheter change or antibiotics. It makes no uh, scientific sense to me. But they removed that, and they found little lesions that he had uh, uh, developed during this time uh, that he and his brothers uh, sniffed uh, petrol. Um, but Brian approached the, the screening desk a few times. And so when you observe the, um, the, the, the film or the, the video, he's fine. He's not cognitively impaired. And yet even posthumously, they tried to assign a cognitive uh, deficiency in order to rationalize how he died. It had nothing to do with it. Um, so, but one of the things that was found for Brian specifically, when you go, at the time, you go to the desk, somebody says, who are you? My name is Barry Lavalle, I have chest pain. Uh, he or she will put it down on a piece of paper and get a li list of names, give it to the triage nurse. He or she will say, oh, Barry's uh, chest pain is more important than throat pain and call you in. Uh, when they looked for Brian's name on those papers during that 34 hours, his name was not put down. And that was despite uh, video evidence that Brian, in fact, spoke with a triage person. He made a decision to not put Brian's name down. So from that point forward, he was invisible, except as a drunken Indian sleeping uh, in the uh, eMERGE room. I want you to look at this. This is uh, King Sisyphus. Yeah, some of you might know this. I never knew this. But uh, this is the idea that um, you could, you know, the ball is the problem and you push it up and you almost get to the top and uh, you, it rolls back down and you keep on doing that. And King Sisyphus was, was condemned to do that because I think he loved some other, somebody's wife or something like that. 
But this imagery is really important because it, it tells you about settler society or settler Canada. And so I want you to think of the two people there <coughs> as settlers and that the ball is the ever uh, continuing problematic Indian, always drunk, never can get sober, can never finish grade 12, can never finish the antibiotics, uh, doesn't come to have uh, uh, you know, changes for a diabetic foot, just to use your imagination in the world that you are. And so you always have the, um, the, the uh, incredible settlers who are trying to make the Indian right. And so this is like a Sisyphean task, okay? So we then appear to be the Sisyphean task of settler society. And we can never achieve equity. It's impossible in the current construction of Canada because that Sisyphean uh, imagery is about the inequities that arise from the structural racism that serves white people and other, other settlers in Canada and ensures that Indigenous peoples find themselves in poverty, find themselves ill, find themselves in a whole number of ways that it's very difficult uh, to achieve uh, equity. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so what happens? The settler Canada set, uh, settles for the second best, and that's the dead and dying Indian, and the rationalizing continues. And so after 1492, uh, when settlers came to our island here, they saw people in communities where 50% of people had died because of disease. And so they did the rational thing, and that's to kill them, even more Indians, like through uh, genocide. Uh, because when people came here, they saw really clear lands. Half of us had been killed already. And then, so they just continued. So the idea is that when the ensuing white people came, you know, in 1700, 1750, uh, 1800, 1850, 1900, what they saw really were remnants of a vast, vast multicultural, multilingual society uh, in North America and South America as well as Central America. And so there is this settler fantasy about the dead and dying Indian. And so Razik uh, uh, contends that the Indian, like um, Brian uh, Sinclair, for example, he would have been seen uh, as the dead and dying Indian by the settler. The only thing you could do then, because they're a vanishing race, is to keep him warm while he dies. You do palliative things. And you have to think about that, okay? Because that really is the scope of the relationship between <laughs> settler uh, systems and indigenous peoples, at least here in Canada, is this fantasy about the dead and dying Indian. Um, well, I'm gonna tell you right now, for indigenous people, um, it's settlers who are our S S Sisyphean task. No matter how many times we, we work over here with white people and, and other settlers and tell them about the history, um, they always forget. <laughs> So we tell them about the history again. And then we talk about racism. And it appears that things don't change. And that's because the backdrop of Scepter Canada is about racism. It is about the inequities. It is about not uh, seeing anybody uh, equally. Are you, are, got a few more, just one more slide. Yeah, good. <laughs> <laughs> so just one thing is just to remember that uh, indigenous peoples are not the Sherpas that carry the white body to the pinnacle of white power and privilege. Um, and that the other thing that's really interesting from not uh, soon after 1492 is that um, um, indigenous people had to know more about you, the settler, uh, than you believe you know about us. This was and remains a fact of survival for us. And you could read about this, this type of uh, narrative. But here is a list of, of uh, some of the uh, texts um, that I use. And if you see uh, the fourth one there is about people of Auschwitz. I spent a lot of hours listening to people who survived uh, the camps uh, during the Second World War, uh, Jews and otherwise, um, because um, I realized when people actually survive the residential schools over here in Canada, and to be able to listen to them as a physician, I had to understand how that kind of imprisonment affected people. And so I learned a lot uh, from the survivors of the uh, camps in, in Europe, to be able to understand how Indigenous peoples might respond after they were imprisoned in residential schools. Anyway, thank you for listening.
Thank you, Barry, and um, uh, sorry for, for getting up, but I just thought I needed to, uh, to prompt you a little, um, uh, because we've, you know, we could spend all day listening to, you know, they're, they're, I think they're great, great examples and really thought-provoking, and, you know, you touched briefly at the end on, on residential schools, which is, a, you know, a very significant issue for us in Australia in, in um, what's happened with the abuse of children by the Church Royal Commission and the outcomes and, and looking at a redress system for, for um, uh, people who have been affected. One of the key issues with that is that they'll be given compensation to be able to get counselling, but if the counsellors are going to come in with, uh, uh, with their own prejudices or, or thoughts without addressing their unconscious bias, the question is how effective are they going to be? And, and we saw just a couple of years ago now uh, in Australia, the Australian Psychological Society apologised to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people um, for the harm that they've done in the past and, and through their practices and behaviours. And, uh, and so, you know, there's a little bit of a... Uh, there's, there's a move, there's a consciousness happening, but, um, but we still have a long way to go.